My name is Tali Grimay and I'm a current master's student in international security. We are sitting here today with distinguished professor Jonathan Edelman, an expert in Middle Eastern and international affairs and a professor at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver to discuss the current conflict between Israel and Hamas. We will begin with a quick summary of the current conflict and discuss Israel's tactics, followed by a quick overview of external and internal factors influencing Hamas, and conclude with U.S. relations and the status of a two-state solution. The international community has been growing increasingly concerned as Hamas militants continue to fire rockets into Israel, and as Israel responds with airstrikes and has now begun a ground offensive. Professor Edelman. Yeah. Can you provide us with a summary of the current conflict that is occurring between Israel and Hamas? Is this an isolated situation or is this part of a larger conflict? It's definitely part of a larger conflict. First of all, as you know, this is not the first time this has happened. Hamas seized control of Gaza in 2007 from Fatah, which then retreated to the West Bank. And then we've had two other major Israeli um, uh, expeditions um, into Gaza. The first occurred right before Barack Obama became president at the end of 2008 to early 2009 um, and that was of course cast lead and then more recently in 2012 we had another invasion this was the Pillars of Cloud which lasted all of eight days. So this first of all is against the backdrop plus Hamas has fired over 4,000 rockets at Israel um, in, in the last 10 years. So there is this kind of continuing um, interaction between the two. But what's changed and what's really fascinating are a couple of important things. Mm -hmm. Number one is that Hamas suddenly finds itself in a very difficult situation. It's lost most of its international support. Most of all, it was of course very happy since its Muslim Brotherhood with the uh, election um, a year and a half ago of Mohamed Morsi from the Muslim Brotherhood to be the president of Egypt. His overthrow last July by um, the Egyptian military led by al-Sisi has completely transformed the situation. The Egyptian military has worked very hard to try to destroy Hamas. It has attacked the uh, jihadists in the Sinai, but most importantly, it's flooded almost a thousand tunnels, uh, often with sewage, to prevent Hamas from getting the kind of supplies that it wants to get. So Egypt has gone from being a friend to a dire enemy. Fatah has no great love, and you can hear that in the words of Abu Mazen. Uh, at one point he actually called them idiots, um, because they're the ones, after all, who drove, who drove Fatah out in 2007. Um, Jordan has made very clear, because Israel is supporting Jordan against, in, in this particular case, ISIS, um, where it stands on the conflict. So as Hamas looks around, it's the uh, the circle around Israel, what it finds, contrary to say a few years ago, is that most of the actors there are either, in the case of Egypt and in the case of Jordan, much more strongly supporting Israel than they did before, or even they have changed sides here. So all of that means that for Hamas it faces a very difficult situation because its sea borders, its air borders, its land borders are surrounded by two countries that absolutely loathe it, Israel and Egypt. Mm -hmm. Wow, so you've touched on that. So how is Operation Protective Edge in other ways different than the previous two conflict, conflicts between Israel and Hamas? Um, as we have seen, Operation Protective Edge has turned into an offensive in Gaza. Um, what are the objectives of the ground offensive, and do you believe that this strategy will encourage Hamas to agree to a sustainable ceasefire? Okay, there are several differences from the two other Israeli offenses against Gaza. Number one is that the primary objective this time is not rockets, it's tunnels. Hamas has built literally thousands of tunnels, almost a virtual underground city, and that was really brought home to the Israelis how dangerous it was because those tunnels are now beginning to go into Israel itself. So that, as we saw when 13 um, Gaza um, terrorist militants, whatever you want to call them, um, emerged from a tunnel right near an Israeli kibbutz. They were spotted and then, were, then an airstrike took care of them, but that really raised the stakes for Israel. So number one, contrary to some things you hear, from the Israeli point of view, it is trying to destroy those tunnels. First, because they can obviously have surprise attacks on Israel. Secondly, because hundreds if not thousands of rockets are actually in those tunnels, and those tunnels are also ways that Hamas gets resupplied. So that's number one. Number two, Israel is well aware of the international situation. 
there's a difference between what you're hearing in public and what you're seeing in private. And you can see that, for example, if you look at memory, the media, Middle East Media Research Institute, they actually quote what people are saying. And what you're hearing is really different than in the past. You're hearing the Saudis, for example, as a columnist in a leading Saudi newspaper, who's saying, why are we not siding with the Israelis? You never heard that before. <laughs> that comes from another important factor, the rise of Iran. And the feeling that is very strong in the Sunni Middle East, which is led by Saudi Arabia and by the Gulf states, that in a confrontation such as they had with Saddam Hussein back in 1990, where the United States came to its aid and launched the Persian Gulf War I, I was actually in Israel at that time, I remember it very well, um, that contrary to that, they're not sure they can rely on the United States to intervene, and they're afraid there'll be a, quote, soft nuclear deal in which Iran will be allowed to be very close to having nuclear weapons, no one's going to inspect them, within a couple of years they will be a nuclear hegemon, the number nine in the world. So that is pushing them in a great direction. The third thing is the Israelis are definitely going after rockets, but there's something a little different this time. They are staying away from the most heavily populated part of the Gaza Strip. Now, of course, the Gaza Strip almost entirely is heavily populated. There's 1.7 million people in 140 square miles. I grew up in Washington, D.C. That's less than 50 square miles. So it's like three times the size of Washington, and instead of 600,000 people, you have almost 2 million people. But nevertheless, there are spaces like on the beaches and elsewhere that are less populated. If you notice, the Israelis have not put troops on the ground in Gaza City. In other words, they are trying to go for military bases, they are trying to go to places where the civilian death count um, will not be all that great. So those are some of the strategic things. The, the final point is very simple. They were very reluctant to do this. You remember they agreed to the ceasefire, uh, to long-range ceasefire, Hamas did not. Um, then, of course, we had the brief five-hour you know, truce. Um, but basically, these, and the other, the other, the final point that's different is the number of Israelis that have been mobilized. It's awesome from an Israeli point of view. They have 68,000 reservists called up. I mean, they are very deadly serious about trying to do all of this. So those are some of the differences. But at the end of the day, the, the conflict itself isn't that much different. But the difference is what's going on internationally, strategically, and on the ground. Okay. So. As you mentioned, in reflecting on the course of the operation, an interesting reaction from the international community has been Hamas's isolation. And, and you just saw Bill Clinton today. Right. Did you see that? No. Bill Clinton came out, and of all places, India, and lambasted Hamas. It really? was very surprising. Um, no, he said, you know, what other choice do they have? They fight you. Could we take 1,300 rockets across the border? It was, it was very interesting because it, it indicated that Bill Clinton and the Clintons are revving up for a campaign. Right. I mean, you saw it in Hillary's interview, yes, which was on television was, yesterday. Yes, I saw that. Uh, I saw that. We all saw that. Um, if she's not running, I don't know what she's doing. Well, she said that she wanted an office that was not four corners, but more oval. But that's aside from the point. She said that? <laughs> yeah. I missed that. I missed that she's part She's moving of the into interview. a place that's not cor in the corners. There's a little bit more of a round space. <laughs> well, and so certainly the 2016, you know, uh, presidential election is, was definitely well off the ground, even more so for the Republicans than it is for the Democrats. Right. Um, Since we don't know who, if anyone, would oppose Hillary Clinton in the Democratic Party. Right, which would be very interesting. Um, so we've seen that international um, isolation, especially from natural rivals and from former allies, too, as you mentioned, Egypt. Um, but can you shed some light also on some of the internal conflicts inside Gaza, such as between Hamas and the Gazan population, as well as between many jihadist organizations, such as Islamic Jihad, which is along the river right. of Iran, and Ansar Beit al-Maqdas, which is an enemy of Egypt, um, and so on? Right. Well, we, we can rely on some polling data that's been done on, from West Bank sources, um, from other Palestinians who've gone into Gaza and done some polling. And the, the most recent poll is a couple months old, but it was very interesting. The poll showed that the majority of Gazans do not like Hamas. That if you compare it to Fatah, um, basically about a third of Gazans support Hamas. That means the majority do not. And then there's some other interesting poll data, even more interesting. One poll asked them, if you could leave Gaza, would you? 43% of Gazans, almost half, said, we'd leave in a minute. Wow. In other words, the level of dedication to it for Hamas isn't that great. In fact, if you go through the Middle East in general, including even Iran, you tend to find a number for the support, the numbers of people who actually support of various forms of radical Islam. And it comes in at least five flavors these days. 
um, roughly at 20 to 30 percent. I'm not sure why, but it tends to be roughly in that ballpark, between a fifth and a third. But for most Gaussians, that's the one thing the media is not talking about. People don't talk about some basic things, and perhaps the most basic thing is what is how are you living? And the fact is that Gaza, if you look at GDP per capita, the United States is at 52,000, the Germans are at 40,000, Gaza is at 875. Mm -hmm. Gazans live at the same level as Afghanis. Mm -hmm. And if you ask, what about unemployment? And this is not because of Israel right now, by the way. This is because of what the, uh, it really accelerated by what the Egyptians did. Gaza has 43% unemployment rate. So the economic situation, which almost no one's talking about here, um, it's just unbelievable. Um, it also has a very high birth rate. Um, the world, including the Arab world, including, by the way, the Persian world, which is down to two to two and a half children per family, in India from six down to three, in China, where I just was, you know, they've gone from three or four to 1.6, but there they're close to five. So they're really out of kilter with a great deal of, of what's going on in the rest of the world. But what's fascinating is a large number of people in Gaza really want something else. I don't think they know what they want, but it's clear they're not happy with the situation either. And why would they be? I mean, if you really look at it, it's a terrible, terrible life. That, that I think everyone in all sides can agree on one thing. Can't agree on a lot of other things. So they can agree life in Gaza is simply terrible. If almost half the population wants to leave, I mean, that's almost unbelievable. And here's the funniest point, but it's not funny, it's not even humorous. Where is Khalid Mashal, their leader? He's not in Gaza. He is their leader. He was the head of their Politburo when they used to be in Damascus. He's sitting in, in Qatar, Qatar, down in the Persian Gulf, with, according to one study, millions of dollars. And he's telling people in Gaza who are suffering from so many things that almost take too much more time than we have to talk about how many things they're suffering from. But they're suffering from a lot of things. Um, and he's telling them what to do, that they should struggle to the end. Well, at the very least, you ought to get there and, and be with them. Can you imagine George Washington saying, I think I'm going to be in England during the Revolutionary War. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, come on, I can't guys. imagine that. No, I mean, <laughs> you really. know, rather than a Valley Forge suffering right. and starving with the, with the rest of the people. Right. But that's not lost on the people in Gaza. No. They're aware of these things. Can't miss it. No. It's, I mean, it's Which a, is a tragedy. If you really want to look at Absolutely. it, it's a tragedy on all sides. Absolutely. It's a tragedy for the Israelis, the rockets that come across. It's definitely a tragedy that people live that way. Because even if you go to the West Bank, you'll see a seriously higher, they're at about 2,500 to 3,000 GDP per capita, which is not great, but at least Hi. people are not starving. And it's not, they have, their unemployment rate is much lower, too. And there's even some foreign investment going in. Who's going to invest in Gaza? Yeah. It's sad. It, it actually, I think everyone agrees on all sides. And one thing is true. It's a very sad situation. Absolutely. Kind of hopeless. Absolutely. As, as you've mentioned, um, even if Hamas is eradicated, considering um, its isolation and um, its complete lack of support from within by the people as well, um, alternatives might take shape in the form of even more radical terrorist organizations such as ISIS. Um, or the Salafists. Or the Salafists. Who got 25% of the vote in Egypt. Right. And who want to bring back the, the caliphate of the 7th century. Right. And so it, it seems that Israel will always have to fight to exist. Um, what is the current United States position on Israel, on the situation? Um, if you can just. Well, the, 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 the United States, the government the, uh, under President Barack Obama. Um, has made clear that they support Israel's right to intervene, but they've also, John Kerry, keeps calling um, for an end to the escalation. So, you know, the problem here is, of course, John Kerry's, uh, you know, back and forth diplomacy, you know, shuttle diplomacy, we could call it, um, between the West Bank and Israel didn't, unfortunately, yield anything. Um, there's one other point to keep in mind that a lot of people ignore, which is that What's also amazing about Gaza is nobody really wants to be in charge. Mm -hmm. You can remember in the late 80s, Shimon Peres, who back then was um, the Prime Minister of Israel, offered Hosni Mubarak of Egypt, he said, I will just give you Gaza. We'll withdraw. It's all yours. We've had more than enough of this. And guess what? Hosni Mubarak, and they had ruled Gaza from 48 to 67, said, not on your life. So we have a problem of an unwanted child, whereas that is also another problem, that the, the Arab world also is like, not us, we're not going to take care of it. 
And so they're neglected in a, in, a, in a certain sense. They don't have, like the Americans had for a long time, after the two wars with the Brits, they had a very good relationship, and Britain was a powerful country around the world. And America, for example, got 25% of all its investment in the 19th century from England. Gaza, which a few years ago, and Hamas seemed to have some you know, people, countries and leaders that were going to help look after and try to make it develop. Now they're saying, look, there's much greater problems in, in here. We've got ISIS, we've got al-Nusra, we've got the Salafists, we've got al-Qaeda, and now, of course, um, Muslim Brotherhood. We, we don't want to deal with this. This is not our issue. And so that's something that people don't want to talk about. But the reality is that most of the other parts of the Arab world are much more concerned about the Iranian nuclear threat. They're much more concerned about ISIS, for example. The Jordanians have made a Jordanian representative. So ISIS is going to come. They've already pledged to overthrow the Jordanian right. monarchy. That's what we're worried about. Our problem. That's not our problem anymore. And that's just, you know, that's, yeah. that, that also is another aspect we're not talking about. It's not just that there's more support for Israel. There's just a lot of support out there for that's not our problem. We have our own problems. You go solve it yourself, which they clearly can't. Because right. Hamas is reduced to 140 square miles. They thought because their you know parent organization was in charge of Egypt that they were going to be part of all of that. That's that's gone. And it's all gone. Uh, by the way, I'm not saying I'm trying to apologize for. It. I'm just saying that's their view. <laughs> right. They feel very isolated too right now. Right. Right. Um, so I want to kind of turn it maybe to an optimistic point of view, um, where um, how like how has this current conflict affected the hope of a two-state solution, you know, and what does this mean for the larger peace process? Well, it's obviously very negative, because the first problem is that we talk about the Palestinians, but there is, there is no such entity as the Palestinians. Today, there's two Palestinian entities who really are rivals, really under, not even under the table, even above the table, absolutely detest each other. The kind of more moderate secularist, the Fatah, which originally came from Yasser Arafat, and the more radical, but not the most radical. That's another irony of the situation. There are much more radical Islamic fundamentalists than even Muslim Brotherhood. ISIS definitely is, Salafis definitely are, Al Nusra, hard to say, but they, at least they're at the same level. And who knows where Al Qaeda is today? So, I mean, for ISIS to be said to be a threat to Al Qaeda tells you how bad the world has gotten out there. So, given all of that, um, I think it's hard to be optimistic. But I think the, the, the path forward is one which, I, I, which John Kerry actually said. And I think it is the way to go. Since the political situation is just so difficult, and after all, the Israelis left in 2005 and things have not gotten better there, I think the one thing that Kerry said that was really important was, let's try a different path. Let's try economic development. You know, Karl Marx once said, and there are not a lot of things he said I agree with, but one thing he did say I do agree with is, is an economic base for political superstructure. There just is no economic base for a solid, evolving, middle-class, semi-democratic regime in Gaza. And to do that, we're starting in the West Bank. I mean, he offered $4 billion, and instead of this being maintenance, so to speak, to really invest, and we're starting to see some of that. There are suburbs that are now going in around Ramallah. The West Bank Palestinians are working together with the Israelis. So if you're a foreign tourist and you go to Jerusalem, as 90% of all tourists go to Israel, because go to Jerusalem for obvious reasons, um, and you want to go to the West Bank, you want to go to Ramallah, um, you want to go um, to um, any of three or four other major cities, some of which are very biblical, okay, Annapolis, for example, um, you can do it. The Israelis provide the bus, and the tourist money gets spent there on the West Bank. So there's a kind of, and there's beginning to be a high-tech collaboration. Um, we have to give Google some credit for this. Eric Schmidt was recently in Israel, and he said the number one thing is Israel exports $20 billion in high tech, is I want, my desire is I want you to start hiring Palestinians from the West Bank. And the Israelis have done it, largely out of self-interest, because the Russians have stopped coming. They had a million come, and that doubled the size of Silicon Valley. But suddenly, economics can help build a base. There has to be somewhere a base. And that base can be internal, but also external. It's starting to work with each other um, without warfare. And I think, in a way, which every, it's a win-win for everyone. It's a win for Israeli high-tech. It's a win for West Bank Palestinians who get to work 
in an international environment and even travel abroad and do things. So I think the way that Eric Schmidt was talking about is given how hard the situation is, let's see if we can try something else. Let's face it, it sounds like out of the great Gatsby, but greed works. Everybody understands that we need money, we want to get involved, and we want the Palestinians to develop that middle class, and there is some middle class at least on the West Bank, and if we can get them to develop a strong um, high-tech industry, that would be a great start. There are already, so for example, within Israel, Israeli Palestinians, or Israeli Arabs, depending on which one to call them, there's one and a half million of them. There are 14,000 of them right now studying in Israeli universities. Every year, Israeli universities graduate 1,500 of them in STEM, which, by the way, is now a new development at the University of Denver that's really impressive what's going on in STEM. And so extending that to really get the Arab world into the high-tech revolution, whether they're West Bank, whether if the Gazans will agree to quiet down and return for some access to the rest of the world, and to work together, not just with Israelis, but with Europeans, like in the Horizon 2020 project, where they're spending $70 billion to try to advance the Europeans in this area, I think that at least would offer maybe no short-term solution, but at least it would begin to create a group of people who have some basis to look at each other as potential partners rather than as just enemies. Well, thank you so much for your time. Great. And thank you very much. Yeah.